uh, what is best for you in your worst moment. Um, hopefully that slides up behind me, it says it is on my iPad. What is best for you in your worst moment? Now, I don't just want this question to be a kind of glib, kind of engaging question to kind of stop you from falling asleep halfway through. I really want you to think about it. I really want you to think what is best for you in your worst moment, which then means that you're thinking hopefully about your worst moment, your worst fear. What is best for you in your worst moment? Might be the worst moment of betrayal. Maybe it's a friend that betrays you. Maybe you betray a friend and you live with the shame of that for the rest of your life. What is best for you in that moment, whether you're the one that's been betrayed or you're doing the betraying? What would you say to such a person? Would you tell them to harden up? Would you tell them that God's grace is enough for them? Would you tell them that maybe they should start a blog or they're just a poor thing and maybe go get a bit of therapy or whatever? What would, uh, what would be the best, for them, best thing for them in their worst moment? Or maybe the worst moment of suffering. Maybe physical suffering, maybe emotional suffering, maybe abuse of some sort. What would be the best thing for you if you're experiencing that? Remembering that we are all going to experience extreme suffering at some point or another. It's called death. What would be the best thing for you in that worst moment or the worst moment of loss? Maybe loss of someone you really love, your husband, your wife, a child, father, mother, friend. That's a terrible fear that I think many of us have. What would be the best thing for you in the worst moment of loss? What is the best for you in your worst moment? And as you know, we're up to John 16, and you can turn there now if, if you don't mind, John 16. I'm going to be reading from verse 1 through to about 15 or 16, obviously overlapping a little bit with what Raji took us through last week. But I just find this whole dialogue from Jesus with his disciples at the Last Supper, and then as they're walking to the Garden of Gethsemane, so frustrating. Because do, sorry, frustrating. Sorry, interesting and frustrating. Um, it's interesting because he says these, oh, they, what are they? They, they? They're almost infuriating in one way or could be taken as infuriating because the worst possible stuff is about to happen to him and his disciples and yet he insists on saying things like, remember our first memory verse? Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. Remember that came just after he had said that, Peter, you're going to deny me. The rest of you are going to run away from me. I'm going to the cross and he goes, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also. I mean, like, like, who says that kind of thing? Yeah, Jesus. <laughs> but like, have you thought about just how amazing that really is? And we're at a similar moment here now. Back in John 14, 31, Jesus says, come now, let us leave. So they've actually left the place where they were having that last meal together. And they are now walking through Jerusalem. Later on, they'll say, he'll say again, let us leave. And some commentators have gone, oh, is that a contradiction? It's not really a contradiction. They've left the building. Then they leave the city to go to Gethsemane. So at this point, they're walking through the streets of Jerusalem. You know, the I am the vine. Probably there was a vine there. He probably snapped it off and said, you know what? This is what you're like if you don't abide in me. I wouldn't build a doctrine on that, but that's probably why he said it, because he could see it and they could see it. And so imagine this scene. We know that it's Easter. We know that annually that calendar is roughly right, or it's actually precisely right, with the moon. So we know that this night, it is, the moon is about 97%. I looked it up. I used my, my app. That on the next night, which will be the Passover, it will be full. So they've already gone into the night. They've already had their meal together and so forth, and they're walking, and it's dark, and the moon is up. Now, 97% might as well be full, Okay. So there's this eerie kind of moonlight. Jesus is talking as they're walking along. And these are the things that he's saying to them in these next few verses. And it's so surprising because he is essentially saying, I'm going to experience my worst moment. You are going to experience your worst moments, betrayal, suffering, loss, death. 
So what does Jesus want to say to them? What does he want them to know is best for them in those moments? Like I said, it's really quite surprising. So let's just read it together. John 16, 1 to 16. <clears throat> All this I have told you so that you will not go astray. They, the Jewish religious leaders, will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering a service to God. This is not surprising given what just happened in Paris. Many people think they're offering a service to God and they are not. They are offering a service to the God of this world who desires death and destruction. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when the time comes, you'll remember that I warned you. I did not tell you this at first because I was with you. Verse 5, now I am going to him who sent me, yet none of you ask me, where are you going? Because I have said these things, you are filled with grief. But I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I am going away. So I'm going to read that verse again. I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counsel will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment, in regard to sin because men do not believe in me, in regard to righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and in regard to judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. In a little while, you will see me no more. And then after a little while, you will see me. Let's just pray together. Oh, Father, my little presentation here and my study and my words are really not enough for you. We just sung, how majestic is your name? And yet that's what you call us to do, to take little words and little bits of time and use them. And I just pray that this little offering would somehow just puncture the ceiling and bring the glory of the living God you, your love for us, your compassion for us, your holiness, your awesome sovereignty, all these things would come together as we study the beautiful and precious Holy Spirit together. In Jesus' name, amen. But I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I'm going away. So there's the, this moonlight walk as they head out to Gethsemane. It's eerie, it's colourless, it's sad, it's fearful. He tells them they are going to suffer and die and be flogged in that first one to four verses of this chapter. He's already told them that same thing is going to happen to him. He's going to be crucified and died. Peter's going to deny. Judas is going to betray and already has. The rest of the disciples are going to run and desert. Now, by this time, they're pretty upset. They're starting, I think, to get it. And then Jesus says in verse 5, Now I am going to him who sent me, yet none of you ask me where you are going. Because I have said these things, you are filled with grief. They are now so choked up, they can't even ask again, where are you going? They've asked this a few times through the last two or three chapters. Jesus has answered each time. Now they're just, this is too much. But then he says, I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I'm going away. Now just consider what is about to happen here because for the last three years, the disciples have been able to go and talk to him and go, you know what, Lord, I've got a question for you. Lord, I just, I just saw you walk across that five kilometers of water. Lord, I just saw you speaking to that woman. You went out of your way for her, remember that? We, we went through that a few months ago. You could just go and talk to him. You could see the face of God. You could see the image of God in the face of Christ. Now, they're about to lose that. And yet Jesus insists on saying, it's actually better for you now, guys. It's better for you that I'm going away. 
that means in some way it's better for us also. I mean, who wouldn't want to walk with Jesus in his physical bodily form? Like who wouldn't want to sit with him, have a meal with him? How cool would that be? And yet Jesus here is saying, you know what? That is not what's best for you. What is best for you is the next few verses. And that's what we're going to have a look at now. I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I'm going away. It is for your good. It is in other versions that says better for you that I'm going away. It is, it is blessed for you that I'm going away. How, how can that be? Let's have a look at just these next few verses. First of all, in verse 7, he says, I tell you the truth, it is good for you that I'm going away. What does going away mean? Have you, have you thought about that? He's, so he's going to the cross. That's where he's going. Remember, he says, I'm going to go away for a little while. You won't see me. And then you're going to see me. Now, this is kind of cool because while he goes through the trauma of the cross, while he becomes a mangled lamb for the whole of the world, he's not going to be seen by the disciples. He's going to spend that three days in a tomb. He's going away. And then after a little while, they'll see me. Now, there isn't another break after that. Now, we know that he's on earth for a little while. But then later on, he says he, he, there's the ascension. The spirit comes. And so already he's saying, you know, it's better for me that I'm going away. I'm going via the cross. To go via the cross means that we can actually enjoy the fullness and the oneness of what's about to come through the Holy Spirit. Now, we think about Paris and we think about things that we see on TV at a certain time of the year with certain religions. What is that all about? People washing themselves in certain rivers, people making pilgrimages. What is that about? It is about people trying to get closer to God, trying to make themselves right, make themselves clean, please God in some way. Here we have our God who says, uh -uh, I am coming for you. I am going to the cross. It is actually better for the disciples because at its current state here on that kind of moonlit walk, he has not yet won redemption for them. He is about to, but that is all a part of him going away. So it is better because he has to go to the cross and win that restoration of relationship so that we one day will walk with him again also. He is going to the cross. He is going to win redemption. He is going to win oneness. And it's kind of death-bustingly awesome, but it's not the best thing. It's not the best thing from the, for them to hear in that moment. He's got more for them. It's awesome, but there's more. The sacrifice of the Son means the sending of the Spirit. The sacrifice of the Son means the sending of the Spirit. You know, often we camp on the crucifixion and it's such a beautiful thing to do to consider Christ. But did you know that that was a single point in time? It was a single event designed to win us restoration and relationship with our God. It is better for us now to know that the cross isn't a historical event, it's a theological event, it's a spiritual event, it's a restorative event. But now he has sent the counsellor. Verse 7, unless I, um, but I tell you the truth, it's good for them going away. Unless I go away, the counsellor, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And it's interesting because I can almost guarantee that if I looked at all your uh, versions, you would all have different words for the Holy Spirit. And the reason is, is that Greek word paraclete, it, it, there is no English equivalent for it. Traditionally, it was um, rendered comforter, which kind of makes it sound a bit like a blanket in today's English. So all these words, I want to kind of say, listen, it's not, it is a, that's a part of the truth of the Spirit with us, but it's not the only truth. So first of all, there's the, the, the idea of the comforter. Then we're told he's also called the helper in some versions. We're told he's called the advocate. More modern translations are using that now. The advocate sort of makes sense in a more legal kind of way, but also, I guess, a, a social justice kind of way when we have an advocate. So he is counsellor, helper, comforter, advocate, spirit of God, Holy Spirit, branch back out in the Old Testament, hovering over the waters, drawing them together, charging through the open waters, we're told in some of the prophets that it was the Holy Spirit leading them through the waters of the Red Sea. The Holy Spirit who empowers Samson. Where'd he get his biceps from? 
It wasn't steroids. It was the Holy Spirit empowering him. King David, when he writes his beautiful Psalms, who, 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 who really wrote them? The Spirit, you know, he's like Psalm 23 at, at funerals and stuff like that. It's the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is saying, in your darkest moment, in your worst moment, I'm not going to tell you to harden up. He's told them that other times. Uh, I'm not going to just tell you that it's going to be okay, guys. I'm not just going to tell you about your hope in heaven. He's told them all that. But he knows them very well. He knows that the only thing that can really give them hope is for them to know that they're not going to be left as orphans. They are going to get the counsellor, the helper, the comforter, the advocate, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. In Philippians 1.19, we're told that's the Spirit of Jesus. It is better for us and it is good for us because the counsellor is coming. And when the counsellor comes, now we've already been told through the 13, 14, 15, 16, those chapters, that he's going to bring us hope, he's going to bring us peace. Now, Jesus is saying, this is something else that he's going to do. It's not just going to be limited to you, guys. It's going to be going, he, the Spirit, is going to be going to the world. Verse 8, when he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. Another way you could render that, and some of your versions would have it, is that he will prove the world in the wrong about sin, righteousness and judgment. Do you realize that everyone in the world has some concept of sin, of righteousness and judgment? So they have some concept of what it is to do something wrong. They have some concept of what it is to have a moral yardstick and you know, be moral creatures. And they have some concept of what it is to be judged, to receive just punishment or just reward for certain behaviours. But unless they are aligned with the one true God, they are actually distorted. And it doesn't matter one jot if Tim approves of me or you approve of me or if you think I'm sinning or not sinning. I mean, of course, I want to listen to you as my brothers and sisters. What really matters is God's yardstick of sin, judgment and righteousness. And what, what Jesus is saying here is in verse 8, he'll convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. It's not just going to be words on a page or words on tablets. It's going to be this internal kind of voice that's convicting. Earlier, we were told the world cannot recognize the spirit. He cannot recognize God, cannot recognize the things of the, of the earth. So Jesus tells us here that he is going to send the Spirit to shake people, to speak to them. In, um, you'll come to me. In 2 Corinthians 4, we are told that the God of this age has blinded the mind of the unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the glory of the gospel of Christ, who is the image of God. So what has to happen? The Holy Spirit has to go. It's going to shake people a bit. He might do it through circumstances. But in it all, there's going to be this kind of idea that, you know what, this idea that I have of sin, my internal idea of righteousness and justice, it's not right. And Jesus wants his disciples to hear this because after he's resurrected, he's going to tell them, go out to the world. This is going to be great comfort for them because who's the greatest evangelist of them all? The Holy Spirit. He's already going out to these cities of Corinth and Ephesus after Pentecost and convicting. So let's just have a look at some of what he'll do in terms of convicting. First of all, in verse 9, in regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. In John, belief is always um, kind of the verb form of trust. It's a doing word. It's a, it's a depending kind of idea. So right now, the biggest problem of all is not so much that someone's looking at porn or someone's you know, cheating on their wife or someone's pulled guns in Paris. The biggest problem of all is a lack of understanding about who God is in Jesus. The biggest problem of all is a lack of love. The root of sin always goes back to lovelessness. Love, a loveless idea of God, a loveless idea of one another. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. They do not trust me. They do not depend on me. So the Spirit is going to have to go out and remind them of the work of Jesus, remind them of the work of Jesus so that they will know the personality of God. They will know that God's glory is being manifest in love on a cross. As he says earlier, when I'm lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. That's what Jesus said. Ultimate in all sin is this hardness towards Jesus, towards the Son, towards God. The Holy Spirit will convict them of that. 
It is also better because in verse 10, in regard to righteousness, he's going to convict them in regard to righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. Now, I really want, I want you to understand this, that Jesus is going. Now, if Jesus could have walked down the main street of Toowoomba, gone into Grand Central, preached a sermon, or maybe just gone and chatted with some of the, um, the shopkeepers and so forth, had a coffee, uh, you know, you would have seen him in perfect righteousness, drinking coffee, I'm sure, I'm not sure what type, but he... <laughs> He would have been there and he would have been doing that perfectly. In, 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 you know, we always have this highfalutin idea of righteousness of being in some cathedral somewhere. It didn't involve cathedrals with Jesus. It involved, involved day-to-day life. Now he's going. Guess what, though? You have the spirit of Jesus. So in living your day-to-day life, the world is going to see right living. Yes, yeah, not perfect living. You're not Jesus. But they're going to see that righteous living just infused in everyday life. The way you drink your coffee, the way you clean your house, the way you treat your wife or your husband, the way you treat your parents, the way you think about where am I going in this world? What should I be doing with my life? You know, seeking first the kingdom. Again, not perfectly, but the Holy Spirit is going to do that in you. And that's going to be like a convicting thing. As like Ben was saying before, you know, I wish he'd shared a bit more, but he's been talking to these guys for so long. And, you know, there's been frustrations and those kinds of things and, and really strong ideas. And, and then all of a sudden there's that power and, and freedom and, and liberty that comes. But I can tell you that if it was just words and just a tract handed to them, it would have no impact. Because, well, I shouldn't say that. It might if the Holy Spirit's got a hold of it, you know what I'm saying? But because they know him, they watched him for months, for years maybe, and maybe will continue to do so, they see something about his life. Again, it's not perfect. He knows that. It is better because he will convict of righteousness. And then, of course, it is better because he will convict of judgment. And this is interesting because you kind of think, in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Now, when you read that, you go, in regard to judgment, and you're automatically thinking, oh, he's talking about the judgment at the end of time, where we will face completely exposed, every word exposed. It'll be the real Facebook, guys. He's going to open up. God has his own version. Um, Again, I wouldn't build a doctrine on that. But when he opens it up, <laughs> when he opens it up, you'll see everything, okay? And you'll stand before him. And you'd want to hope that you have bent the knee and you are relying on Jesus. And he stands up and says, that, that one's mine. You'd want to hope that. But actually, what Jesus is talking about here, because remember, he's trying to bring hope to these guys. And he's telling them that what the Spirit will do is in regard to judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Do you remember what I said before about what the prince of this world is doing? I'm so thankful, Rick, that just fitted in so well, all that stuff. He's deceiving. He's discouraging. He's distorting. Now, understand that this is people's reality. You want to go and see most movies. What is it about? It's a sense of Hopelessness. It's a sense of sense of you know authoritarian figures doing the wrong thing nowadays. It's a sense that people are you know, corrupt and there's no real hope there. And there's a sense that there is no concept of God. You know, watching this show called The Librarians at the moment, and they decided to have this kind of real nice thing about Christmas. They did not mention once the origins of Christmas, except for Saint Nick and Father Christmas, and I was just, I was just thinking, what, what is that? Again, it's part of that distortion, that deceit. Um, now, what Jesus is saying here is, you know what? When I go to the cross, in fact, right now, he says, because of the prince, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. The prince of this world and his power have been broken. We know later on we're told that he makes a mockery of principalities and powers at the cross. So you often think, oh, people are deceived, people are deceived. Like you're probably deceived yourself sometimes. But understand that the power of the Spirit is the power of grace and truth. And so he is going out and the prince of this world stands condemned because he's got nothing left. Once deceit and that is pierced, nothing left. He's condemned. And we know that he's condemned at the end of the age as well. Verse 12, it is better because you can't bear too much. This must be one of the most hope-filled sentences, I think, in this passage. And I'll tell you why. I'll just read it. Verse 12, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. 
Isn't it nice to know that the God of, universe, the God of the universe, who is in Jesus here, realizes that if he told us too much, we'd be in a world of hurt. We would just give up. Can you imagine if Peter knew that he was going to be, as church tradition holds it, crucified upside down? I mean, can you even imagine if he just said, you know what, Peter, a few days from now, you are going to go up against the Sanhedrin, the very people that are going to kill me, and you're going to proclaim boldly and tell them that they are the ones that condemn me. I would be, no, that's, well, that's too much, Lord. Hold on a minute. You know, I just, I just know in my heart of hearts, just knowing some of you guys for a fair while now, that you know, there's, there could be some awesome, great things that you're going to do. And Jesus knows what they are. But if you were told what they were right now, it would be, whoa, too much. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. He knows us. He knows that he will progressively reveal things to us, not just about his call on our lives, but also doctrinally, better understanding of who he is, better understanding of his requirements for us and holy living and kingdom values and kingdom culture. And that's why I love this next verse, verse 13. But when he, the spirit of who? Truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. So he's not going to take you and face plant you in the truth like we like to do sometimes. Maybe that's just me. Um, he's not going to face plant you. He's going to reveal things according to almost a curriculum, a journey progressively. Jesus is only there for three years. Holy Spirit's been here for 2,000 years. Encouraging, teaching, guiding us into all truth. And I just want to concentrate on this truth thing because we automatically, I think, well, I did anyway, think, oh, creeds and doctrines, you know, that kind of truth. Yes, that's a part of it. But I want to say that it's all truth. So intellectual truth, relational truth, emotional truth, the reality, the things, the way things really are, not the way that we think they are to be. Now, our feelings are often out of balance with our Reason and our reason is often easily distorted and our will is often captured. But the Spirit is going to guide us into all truth, not just so you can write a cool creed at the end of your life, but so that you know the right way to go in particular circumstances. And again, what you said before, Rick, just tied in really well. Maybe we can even put it on the website. But he's going to guide them into all intellectual truth. So Peter and John shortly we'll go up against the academia of the world of the day and they're going to go we don't know where you're getting this wisdom from and they're going to speak in such a way that they can't be refuted who's that that's the holy spirit guiding them into all truth he's going to guide them into all relational truth as well all relational truth because we are told over and over again that we are to love one another like peter when he writes later on he says above all love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins we're told that the Holy Spirit brings love, joy, peace. They are all relational terms. So he is going to direct us and guide us into living one with another because it is possible to have doctrinal knowledge and be a functional heretic. Do you know what I mean by that? So you in your head, oh, I'm supposed to love love, but your life doesn't involve love. And so, yep, I'm, I'm a believer, but in action, you're a heretic because you're not doing what your master told you to do. But the Spirit's going to help us to do that in day-to-day -day life. He's going to help us to love one another in practical ways and to serve one another in practical ways. And when it happens, it won't be us going, oh, well, that was Adrian Park. It'll be, that was God. Not we sung up there, God's power in us. In verse 14, we are told that he, the Spirit, will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. So the Spirit will speak deep unto deep. He will make Jesus real to us. It will be the Spirit of Jesus with us. And he's going to take glory. Now, glory in the Gospel of John is always about oh, the stars in heaven, like Tim was talking about. But then the next part, which is uh, Jesus coming and dying. So the guy who or the, the, the being who creates the cosmos coming and dying as a man. That's glory. And then rising from the dead. That's glory. So that's what the Holy Spirit is going to guide us into. All truth from Jesus. And so as we get to the end now, I just want to ask that question again. What is best for you in your worst moment? 
You know, what, what is best for the disciples in their worst moment from this passage? What is best for you in the worst moment of betrayal, suffering, you know, when the day goes from light, thanks Camille, I'm cooking down, um, when that darkness starts to come as it must for all of us in this world, or just every other moment, like, you know, the moment of anger, the moment of boredom, the moment of fear, of anxiety, of laziness, of apathy, the moment of lust. Like, what is best for you in that moment? H- have you got it yet? I, like, I don't know, we just get these truths and we, we turn them into cliches emotionally. We turn them into cliches intellectually. Like, what is best for us is that he is with us. Now, I just wanted to touch on this as I finish. I have told you. He says this six times in the last words to his disciples. I call them I have the, the, the I have told you verses. The first time he says, um, I have told, and I just want to go through them. I have told you. Oh, sorry, I'll start again. If we go back to John 14, he says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. So he is telling them all about the Father's house. He is telling them all about the fact that that's where they're going. Don't get the middle chapter mixed up with the end chapter. You know, Don't get too bogged down now with all the suffering. Remember, you're going somewhere. So he tells them, there's the first I have told you. The next one is, I have told you now, this is John 14, 29, I have told you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you'll believe that he is going to the Father. So he's telling them that so that they will believe and keep on trusting. This is all in the last words to his disciples. And then John 15, 11, I have told you this about abiding in the vine, as Tim talk us, t- talked us through, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Okay, so these are all the words that he's telling them. John 16, 1 at the start of this chapter. I have told you this, all of this, so that you will not go astray. Then in verse 4, I have told you this so that when the time comes, you will remember that I warned you. Again, helping them to keep believing, to keep trusting. John 16, 33, that we'll hear from Ben next week. I have told you these things, all these things about the troubles that are coming, the Holy Spirit that I'm going to send to you, so that in me, you may have peace. This is extraordinary. The troubles that they're in, He's walking along on this moonlit moonlit evening one night before he goes to the cross and he says, you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. I'm telling you this. Don't let your hearts be troubled. I'm telling you now so that you'll trust, so that you'll be complete in me, so that you won't go astray, so that you're warned, so that you'll have peace, so that you might take heart how? How? How when the job is lost or it's just plain boring or we lose a child or we lose a friend or our own life starts to come to an end or the lump isn't benign or there's a gun pulled? How? How not to let your hearts be troubled? Like, there's nothing in you, nothing. But there's something in God. There is everything in him. And so back in John 14, he says, I'll ask the Father, he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. And again, I say, this truth, this one truth, when that scan comes back and that oncologist looks at you and he just has that look, or you get to the end of your life and, the, and, and, and you know, maybe the family's gathered around you, or maybe it's a split second before the impact. I will ask the Father and he will give you another counsellor to be with you forever. Through that moment, through that moment of betrayal, through that moment of loss, I won't leave you as orphans, I will come to you. And then John 17, 26, at the end of his prayer, he says, I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and I myself may be in them. That's only through the Spirit. He is with you guys. You get that? You know, go back to that worst moment. Like, go there now, that worst moment that you're afraid of. He's already there. 
You know, you all live in Adam's house. Do you understand? Adam made a choice for us. He put us in his house. In Adam's house, there is deceit, distortion, there is selfishness, there is murder, there is troubles. That house still stands for a while, but God has said that he is with us in that house of horror. And every good thing that comes to us is just like a foreshadowing of heaven and of life with him. Every bad thing is a warning about life without him. And in it all, he is with you. And we're going to participate now in, the, um, in communion. And I just wanted to, we're going to play this song. And I know you've heard it before, but I don't know if you know the background to it. It's how he loves us. Who wrote that song? Tim, be quiet. Who wrote that song? <laughs> Through the Spirit. Yeah, that'd be a good answer. Crowder, supposedly. Well, no, he didn't. A guy called, um, he just did a cover of it. A guy called John Mark McMillan wrote the song. Now, I just, you guys know what I'm talking about, how he loves us. Luke's going to play it as we come to a time of communion. Okay, let me read such beautiful lyrics. You listen to it. Okay, I don't know if you know the background to it, though. I'll just read from Wikipedia. Very, um, I didn't have time because I just thought of this on the way over here. But So John Mark McMillan wrote How He Loves Us following the death of his best friend, Stephen Coffey. Coffey was a youth minister for the Morning Star Ministries on November 1st, 2002, during a church prayer meeting. Coffey prayed out loud, I'd give my life today if it would shake the youth of the nation. That very night, in a multi-car accident, he died of serious injuries. Meanwhile, McMillan... <clears throat> was recording in a studio when he received a call that two of his friends had been critically injured in a car accident. Later that evening, he received another call from his father who informed Macmillan that Coffey had died. The next day, Macmillan wrote How He Loves as a tribute to Coffey and out of a need to have some sort of conversation with God where he could speak his frustrations and emotions over his best friend's death. According to Macmillan, the love that he's singing about in How He Loves is not a pretty Hollywood hot pink love. It's a kind of love that is willing to love even when things are difficult and messy. Now, mark the next words here very carefully because that is not in on, in on of ourselves. This is where it comes from. This song isn't a celebration of weakness or anger. Be careful of songs that are just gratuitously, woe is me. This song isn't a celebration of weakness and anger. It's a celebration of a God who would want to hang with us through all these things, who would want to be part of our lives through these things. And despite who we are, he would want to be part of us, our community, our family. Think about that for a moment. Like God sits in absolute perfection with his son, with the Holy Spirit, and he chooses to suffer with us, to be with us in our suffering. We know that he loves us and he chooses to do that. He's already done it magnificently in what we are about to remember. But he continues to do that in your day-to-day -day suffering. What other God does that, guys? Like, to me, this is one of the most important sermons I could ever, ever preach. I wish I had an awesome soundtrack. He just deserves it. Maybe I'll get one in heaven. I don't know. But he is with you. Emmanuel, God with us. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Let's pray. how you love us, and we want to love you all the more. So, Father, this week, you know what our fears are, you know what sprung to each and every mind, and you know what will gnaw away at us, and yet you have said, do not let your hearts be troubled. You have said that you will not leave us as orphans. You have said that you will be with us until the very end of the age. Oh, Lord, please make that real to us. Please so change our hearts and reform our hearts and just progressively on your journey and your curriculum for us. Teach us, teach us what this means in all truth, not just in the head, but from the heart. Help us as a little church to live this. May your spirit just bring us closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we might start the song, thanks Luke. We'll have a, in your own time, I invite you to come to the bread. I might get Rick if you could break the bread. I'm a bit sweaty. So this is Jesus' body broken for us so that he could be one with us. This is his blood spilt for us 
so that he could be one with us, so we could walk in relationship with him. You know, the best relationship you've ever had, it's just a foreshadowing of this relationship, this very special relationship. And so we're going to celebrate how he has won that for us and just take your time, we'll hold the cup and then we'll share the cup together in your own time, come out, have a listen to the words, we might turn up just a little bit more.